not yet. Okay. What about now? Yes. Ah, oh, that's better. That's better. It's, um, I just wanted to, to greet you all in the name of Jesus. Um, I was quite happy today to see some friends that I've known for some time that I actually grew up with in my home church back home that have come to worship with us. Uh, the Castro family, they, I just wanted to, to just acknowledge their presence today. I, I can't see where they are seated. My eyes are failing me of late. That shows I'm, go, I'm getting out. There they are. They're, they're just waving their hand. I just wanted to acknowledge their presence. They normally go to, uh, they normally go astray and go to Ashfield Church. But today, the spirit led them to, to the best church in Sydney, didn't it? We just want to praise the Lord. I wanted to acknowledge your presence. The Terrors are also good friends. They, they are here, but they normally, sometimes, every now and then, worship with us here. I just wanted to, to acknowledge your presence too. Um, I don't know how many of you were, were blessed by the music this morning. How many of you were blessed? Just the, the kind of music that was coming from this angle. Oh, that was beautiful. All the instrumentalists putting their, their talents together. There's so much talent. I was saying this to, to Pastor Andrew the other day, and I said there's so much music talent in this church, and I, I hope we can, we can um, my brother, we can coordinate this music, I mean this talent more, and actually set this place ablaze with music. Um, I, I'm hoping for that. I'm not a musician myself, but I've got an ear for music. <laughs> Uh, I cannot play any instrument, and um, unfortunately, but don't worry. When we get home, I'm going to pick up my harp, and and I'll play I'll play a harp when we get home. This morning, the title of our message is "The Cloud Is Moving." The cloud is moving. I'm going to read Exodus chapter 33. I'll start reading from verse. 14 through to 15. If you have your Bibles with you, please say Amen. amen. Um, and edge, this is not working. Um, the boys are going to make it work because I like to wander away from the pulpit. Um, if you are there, let's start reading verse 14. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Let us pray. Father, this is your word. I am the work of your hands. These are your people. But I thank you for your presence through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Him alone who can understand the deep things of God. Our prayer is that he may reveal them to us. And we receive the blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite Bible characters is Moses. Outside of Daniel and John the Revelator, Moses is one of my favorite Bible characters for very obvious reasons. And I have the privilege of sharing just a little bit from the life of Moses this morning. And the part of his life that captures me the most is the fourth chapter of Exodus. How many of you have ever read the fourth chapter? This is the part where Moses uh, encounters God in a burning bush. Do you remember that conversation that Moses has? There is some kind of envy in me, Pastor Andrew around Moses and this, and this experience. The Lord has clearly sometimes spoken to me, but it has never been in an audible voice. 
it's through impressions, it's through his word, it's through other people. Someone could just come to me and say, brother, have you ever looked into this? And I can hear the voice of God through that person who is speaking to me. I can have an impression I was just about to do something or I'm doing something and I get an impression and I, I, I know that God is speaking to me through my conscience. I can, I can feel that the Holy Spirit is talking to me. Or I'm reading his word. I said, ah, exactly what I was looking for. And I know that God is talking to me. But it has never been that I'm, I'm alone in a room and I'm praying and God just shows up and he says, Tap you, my son. I don't know how his voice sounds. Moses will tell us one day, but then it will be too late because we'll already be knowing. Um, Moses knows that. Because Moses, as, as the book of Exodus tells us in chapter 33, it says, Moses spoke to God as man speaketh to a friend. Now here is one such encounter in the book of Exodus chapter 4. Um, God is speaking to Moses. And I, 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 I see a lot of myself in Moses. That's why I relate so much with Moses. Here, God is giving his marching orders to Moses in the interest of time. I will not make you read the whole of chapter 4. But Moses, after receiving his marching orders, or after God has pronounced to him what he wants him to do, Moses has these words back to God. And let me read them to you. They are on your screen. Uh, in chapter 4 and the verses 10, Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. This is Moses speaking to God. Let me tell you, my friends, I think Moses is both right and wrong. Why, you ask me, do I think Moses is both right and wrong? Here is the reason. He's right because God's work is beyond humans. I stand with Moses and say, God, this which you are sending us to do is beyond us. It is given to us as men to convince each other, right? I could sell some philosophy to you and you can swallow it hook, line, and sinker. It is within our ability as human beings to convince each other. But the conviction of a heart is not ever immense ability. It is the work of the divine. So Moses knows this perfectly well that God, I'm not eloquent to go to men, to human beings. In fact, to go to the king or an emperor, a powerful emperor of that time, and convince him to let this cheap labor go, I'm not that eloquent. I'm not even too sure I can convince these slaves that have lost their self-esteem to tell them that you are worthy something. There is a God in heaven who loves you so much. I'm not worthy to go to them and tell them that God wants you to come out of this place. Where am I God? I say this to you, my friends, because many times I've been there where Moses is as God is sending him. Are you with me this morning? Yeah. I am saying to you, I... I understand what Moses is saying. I think he's right because we as humans are inadequate. We have weaknesses. And I often say, if they make a mistake of allowing me into the evangelism committee of heaven, if they allow me in the evangelism committee of heaven, I have some suggestions to make. You may agree with me. Or not. But here would be my suggestion. My suggestion would be God, this thing is beyond us as human beings. You are sending us, but it's beyond us. Number two, sometimes we lack the resources, don't we? Do you know that a program such as uh, Ignite? The one we had a few weeks ago, do you know that it costed us as a conference $120,000? $120,000. Pew. 
in one weekend to hire the halls, to hire the equipment. That's a lot of money. But imagine if God would send down that mighty angel called Gabriel. I sometimes think of the other angel. He's not named. He's there in the book of Daniel. He's there in the book of Revelation chapter 10 and Daniel chapter 12. The one who stands one leg in the, in, in, in the waters, in the ocean, and one leg on land, and he raises his hand in heaven, and he says, time is no more. Do you remember that angel? Can you imagine a mighty angel flying with power from heaven? He lands in Sydney, one leg in the waters, one leg on Harbour Bridge, and he lifts up his hand to preach the gospel of the three angels' messages. There is no budget for, for, for a powerful uh, equipment. There is no budget for... for there is, we don't need any money for that. And in just one sermon, 15 minutes... He doesn't go winding like Pastor Tappy. He just goes straight for the message. I can tell you that that day a lot of people in Sydney would be baptized. Amen. Amen. I told you, I would, I would convince you that if they allowed me in the evangelism committee of heaven, I have a point to make. I know the answer though. <clears throat> God will say, I'm not doing that. Fancy idea, Tappy, but I'm not doing that. Go back to earth and do your work. But God, I stand with Moses. I'm inadequate. I have weaknesses. So I say Moses is right. But Moses is also wrong. But God has never been interested in our ability. All he wants is our availability. Let me say that again. God does not look at my inadequacies and weaknesses. Because if I was God, I would not send David or Solomon. In fact, if I were to be honest with you, if I look into the mirror, the guy who looks back at me, if I was God, I would not send him. Because I know him too well. I would not send him. And God says, no, it's not your ability, it's not your, your inability. I just want you to be available. I have a sense, and I'm going to make this clear, I have a sense the way, the reason why God sends feeble and mortal and weak human beings like us is because his work through us is his work in us. He sends sinners. I was sharing with some friends a few, a few, a few weeks ago, and I was saying, how the Lord has worked with me is amazing in the sense that I don't know about you, I, I admire people who say my conversion was on the 25th, 24th of August, 1947. They actually know their date. I, I love that. For me, it's, it's like there's no death. There's, it's just been a process and I'm still in that process. God is still, is still working with me. It's like I'm that, I'm that um, piece of pottery in God's hands that is still molding. And if, if I were to put a date, it would be something like in 1992. In fact, it was not when someone was giving me a Bible study. I remember the pastor coming after, after some time. He said, young man, I want you to do an evangelistic, a youth evangelistic thing here in our church. And I said, pastor, she don't know what you're talking about. I've never done this. And he said, here is the material. He gave me the material. And he said, you just read through this. Preach reading through this. And you know, at first I was reading, after some time I managed to internalize it, and I still remember the seven souls that came to Christ when I was preaching that first evangelistic uh, effort. And as I was preaching, when I, when, I, when I would make the call for people to come to Jesus, somehow as people were coming up, I found God softening my heart. I'm saying to you, my friends, God's work through us is his work in us. My conversion was in my work. Don't you know this, ladies? That the vessel that is used the most is the vessel that is washed the most. You know it in your kitchens. So this process of working for God it's not, it's not because God could not do without us. No, no, no. It is that 
we could not do without God. Hence his work. In Exodus chapter 4, the verses 11 to 12, the Lord said to him, Who gave humans, human beings their mouth? God is responding to, to Moses now. Can you hear that? Who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak. And I'll teach you what to say. Amen. You're slowly beginning to understand why I love Moses. He, he embodies my weaknesses. And as God responds to his weaknesses, I understand how God responds to my weaknesses. Now Moses, after understanding this, he says, God says, I'll go with you. And Moses says, if you don't go with me, I'm not going. Let's go. You are sending me. Let's, let's just establish this right now and right here. I cannot resist this call that you are giving me. I'm going. One condition. You come with me. If you are not going, forget about it. And the text that my young friend has read shows what happens in the work when we are working for God. The devil will not leave us alone. Pharaoh will not leave us alone. And I want to tell you, my friends, that we have, the devil is not our worst enemy. I, it's, a, it's a sermon for another day. The devil is not our worst enemy. Let me tell you why I say he's not our worst enemy. He was defeated at the cross. Our worst enemy is ourselves. We often stand in the way of God's call on our lives. But here's the devil following after Moses. And here is the reason why Moses says, I cannot go without you. The Lord's presence is in the form of a what? A cloud. It appears to us as we go into our sermon this morning that God's presence that, that Moses had asked for has come with him and it is in form of a cloud. Amen. The presence of God is right there above them. By day, it is a pillar of cloud mm. providing shade. By night, it is a pillar of, of fire providing warmth. It is such a protection because the same cloud is as if Moses uses it inter interchangeably with the angel of the Lord. Did you see that? This same pillar of cloud, he says, when the angel of the Lord, capital letter A, when you read somewhere in the spirit of prophets, he says this angel of the Lord is none other than Christ. This angel of the Lord removes or comes away from the front where he has been leading because the, the enemy is approaching. He comes and he, he goes over to, to, to behind them and when he stands there, the, the enemy cannot catch up with them for one night. Hey, catch this. On one side, this cloud is darkness. On the other, it is light. It is the presence of God. One object. Two different things to do two different sets of things. Unto one, a save of light unto life, and to other, a save of darkness unto death. That's why it says, when the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them, the pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them. Now, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm just going to skip a few things here. 
I'm just going straight to their marching orders. The game plan. Israel was not just moving in the desert as Moses leads them to Canaan. There was a particular fashion in which they moved. It did not make sense to anyone who was watching. There is evidence in scripture and also in historical record that um, Moses would have met up with a few other people who asked him what he was doing. What, are you, what on earth, Moses, are you doing? Because you are coming down the peninsula. You could just go straight. If you know Moses, you know the ways of the desert. This is actually the same place where you have been, where you have been heading the, your father-in-law's ship. How can you be, if you know anything, I grew up in the rural areas and, and heading a ship and, and goats and cattle. If, if you want to know the ways of the, of the forest and of the, of the wilderness, ask the head boys. They know it all, all too well. But Moses, what has gone into you? Why are you taking such a long journey? Moses would have told you, I'm following the GPS. <laughs> God's plan of salvation. The cloud, I'm not using my own thoughts, I'm not using my own wisdom. If I were to sit in the counsel of God, I would counsel God that there's a shorter way to go to Canaan from here. Takes less than three weeks and we'll be in Canaan. I don't know why God is taking us down this way. In fact, if you check properly and you do your research properly, the way they were going was dangerous. It was full of danger. So Moses, why are you doing so? That's where the cloud is leading. I cannot go straight into Canaan because if I do that, I am doing it alone. The contract, the covenant, the agreement with God is I'm not taking a step without God. So I'm following where he's going. He knows better how to do this. I want you to know this. Chapter 9 of the book of Numbers tells us exactly how that happened. Chapter 9. This is how it happened. I'm reading on verse 21. Sometimes the cloud stayed only from evening till morning, and when it lifted in the morning, they set out, whether by day or by night. Whenever the cloud lifted, they did what? They set out. Verse 22. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days or a month or a year, the Israelite would remain in camp and not set out. But when it lifted, they would set out. You get the point? Simple. When the cloud is moving, we do what? We move. I don't just... We're not just moving here. We are under the instruction of the cloud, the GPS. Do you love Siri? Sometimes she takes you round and round and round and round. Siri, what are you doing? It looks like this cloud is taking them round and round and round. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. When danger comes, when snakes come to bite, when the waters are bitter, when the desert is dry and you are thirsty, provision and healing is only under the cloud. Nowhere else. Oh, if you are going to be bitten by a snake, please let it happen while you are under the cloud. If you are going to get thirsty and there's no water anywhere, make sure you are under the cloud. Are you at Mara and your marriage is bitter? Make sure you are under the cloud because the enemy, I can assure you, is going to come after your marriage. 
The snakes of sin in this world are going to come after you. After all, you are only flesh and blood. But hey, make sure you are under the cloud. Because there is salvation, there is redemption, there is healing under the cloud. There is restoration under the cloud. I wish I could emphasize that more, but I don't have the time. Chapter 10 of Numbers tells us something. I don't have that on the screen. Let me just read with you. Are you ready, Brother, brother Peter? We are just about to get to that part. Numbers chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses. In chapter 9, we've just been introduced to the fact that if the cloud stops, what do they do? Stop right there. Now, the cloud has been, has been standing here for some time. Then the Lord instructs Moses in chapter 10. He says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, make two silver trumpets. And you know when I came to church this morning, and I saw silver, two trumpets. And I said, praise the Lord. Amen. We've got trumpets in the church. For yourself, and you shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them to call the congregation. So what were the trumpets for? Call the congregation. So when the trumpets blow, it's time for the congregation to do what? Amen. To gather together. Let's, let's hear them though. Then the congregation would know time has come. We are being called to gather together. Now, there was a second reason, if you keep on reading in chapter 10 of Numbers, for these trumpets. Are you ready for it? There was a second reason. In verse 11, it says, On the twentieth day of the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted above the tabernacle of the covenant. Mm. Now, when that happened, when they saw the cloud lifting up, every one of them knew that it is time to pick up your tent. It's time to go. Are you still with me? I'm just about to land now. <laughs> this is where I was going. Then the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and traveled from place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. Did you hear that? But this is how they would set. You've got the picture on the screens. That's how they would camp. The tabernacle is always where? In the middle. In the middle. And it was strategically set out. Imagine yourself. You are some ice. You don't understand what I mean by ice, do you? You were an Amorite or Jebusite or one other ice. You were seeing them approaching from an elevated place or you were seeing them from a hill. They are camped. They were camped in a certain fashion. They were orderly in the way they were doing things. Here was the order. Here was the order. There is the south. There is the east. The east is always the entrance into the sanctuary. I don't have time to, to explain to you that as you entered into the sanctuary, the presence of God is on the holy, on the, on the Ark of the Covenant, which is on the west, which means the sun is behind you. Every other worshiper around them was worshiping the sun in the east. It was just them that were worshiping towards the west, away from the sun. You get the picture? 
Now, so there is the west, there is the east, and there is the north. There is a reason why I'm saying that. If you read in Numbers chapter 10, it makes it clear. I'm just summarizing it for you. When you get home, please read Numbers chapter 10. It says, in the south, in the east, the leading tribe was the tribe of Judah. Are you there? And they had in the east, in the south, the leading tribe was the tribe of Reuben. And in the west, the leading tribe was the tribe of Ephraim. And in the north, the leading tribe was the tribe of Dan. But in the east with Judah was the tribe of Issachar and Zablon. In the south was the tribe of Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. In the west was the tribe of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. In the north was the tribe of Dan, Asher, and Gad. They are the 12 tribes. You see them? That's how they were supposed to care. But the leading man of the tribe of Judah, the elder there, the first elder of the tribe of Reuben, who led the people in the east, he had a standard, he had a flag. This flag had an insignia on it. The insignia was a lion. So imagine this. You are meeting them in the in the in the in the, in the wilderness. They are marching. Right in front is the leading man of the tribe of Judah. And he's holding a flag, and the flag is flying. What's on the flag? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Now you get it. It is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Marching us to war with the cross going on before. You know that song? Yep. Like a mighty army marches the church of God. We are not divided. All one body, we one in, cha in, tra in charity and in doctrine. Mm -hmm. The gates of hell cannot prevail mm -hmm. against, against God's church. Amen. Why? Because we are under the cloud and the lion of the tribe of Judah Amen. is leading. Mm -hmm. Did you get that picture? Mm -hmm. So the trumpet would blow. <clears throat> this is the second use of the trumpet. Hear the trumpet blow. Then the tribes of the east would know it's time to do what? It's time to march. Off they go. The other tribes, they stay put unless they hear the second trumpet. You can find all this that I'm mentioning right now in chapter 10 of the Numbers. Let's blow, brothers. The men, the leading men of the tribe of Reuben would hold his standard. He's actually mentioned in Numbers by name. He's holding the standard on the flag is a picture of a man. I can see some nice go light bulbs going on. The picture of a lion, the picture of a man. Then the third trumpet would blow. The leading men of the tribe of Ephraim would have the picture of an oxen. Is it coming together? Then the last trumpet, which is a call for them to move, would blast. And the leading men of the tribe of Dan will be holding a flag that is a picture of an eagle. I'm just letting the light bulbs go on. This is a picture of the book of Revelation, chapter 4.
these are the standards they are moving. Now, with that in mind, come with me to, 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 to Numbers chapter 10, verse 29. I've just arrived to where I was going with all this. Now Moses said to Hobah, son of Ruel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law. Are you confused? If you are not confused, then you are not understanding this text. It should confuse you. Now Moses said to Hobab, son of Ruel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law. Who is Moses' father-in-law? But it says Ruel here. Well, Ruel was the same, just in short, Ruel was the same man. Ruel is the same man also called Jethro. Ruel is just a nickname. I don't have time to explain this. If you want, let's have some discussion after this. I, we can connect it later. But I have no time right now. I'm looking at my time. I need to learn this plan. Because of some other fish to fry, vegetarian ones. <laughs> now Moses said to Hobab, son of Ruel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, or if you want, other versions would say Ruel, just means the one who loves the Lord. He was the only one around that area. They gave him a nickname, one who loves the Lord. If you grew up in an area like mine, we had nicknames for everyone around us, every elderly person, as young people. It just doesn't happen in Australia, but in my culture, we had a nickname for all the elderly people around us. We are standing out of this place about which the Lord said. Now, who is Hobab? Hobab is Moses' wife's brother. When things got heated, Moses sent his wife back home. Evidence shows that as Moses was now moving in the wilderness, Hobab would have brought his sister back to the wife. Now, Hobab is in this place, he is in this wilderness with Moses. And as Moses is taking off now, as the cloud is moving, Moses understands where this cloud is leading them. He loves his brother-in-law. Are you there with me now? He loves his brother-in-law. What does he say? <coughs> Here's what Moses says. Brother, we are setting out of this place. We are not here to stay. We are setting out of this place about which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us. We will treat you well. The Lord has promised good things to us. Brother, the Lord is good. I know you and your father. You worship Jehovah. But the promise of the Lord is through the remnant. I know in your heart you are sincere. You live up to the light because Raguel, Ruel, Jethro is a worshiper of God too. Is he not? But the seed of the promise is not going to come through Jethro is coming through Abraham. So the children of Israel are the remnant of the time. They have a commission, and their commission is the Lord has promised good to us. You, though you are a worshiper of God, there's much more light to what you have. Come with us. The Lord has promised good to us. This is Moses extending invitation to someone who is out there. Are you with me, church? Mm -hmm. Are you with me now? Mm -hmm. My friends, you and I have our own hobbies in our lives. Sincere worshippers of God in different forms. From different stripes of Christians to Muslims and and Hindus and Buddhist people who are sincere, good people. Oh, Reverend, let me say this to you. 
We do not need to be high-headed about being remnant. To be remnant means to be humble. God has his good children out there. No, no, I, I'm not saying that the promise is through the remnant. They are holding the present truth. Moses and his friend and, 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 and the children of Israel, they have the present truth. But they are not haughty about it. They are not proud. They are not spiritually arrogant about having the truth. They are only humble to be the depositories of God's truth. So what they are going to do is they are going to go to Hobab and say, Hobab, I know you are sincere. I know you love the God that you worship. But God has promised good. Come with us. Come with us. Is there a person like that for you in your life? A person that you look at and you say, this person is sincere. Have you ever looked at a person out there? That is just a good person, sometimes even better than Christians. And you worship them. And your heart just burns within you. And you really want to see them in the kingdom. You know that burning of your heart? It is the action of the Holy Spirit that is saying, invite them, tell them that the Lord has promised good to us. Brother, let's go home. If you get to Judges chapter 5, the descendants of Hobab were given some land. I don't have time to get there. My friends, let me tell you this in closing. Right now, the cloud, Jesus is in the field. When you get to the book of Corinthians, it says, it is him who was in the cloud, Jesus. Now Jesus, where is he at right now as we speak? Jesus' mind is in harvesting his children. Do you know the heart of a father who has been separated from his children after for a long time and he longs to be with his children? Fathers, I'm speaking to you right now. Have you ever gone away with work for some time? And then you have been talking to your children using the phone and uh, what do you call them, Skype and whatever. And you, you, you just want to go home and beat your children. Can you capture that? Mothers, have you ever been there where you have been separated with your children? This is Jesus' heart right now. His mind and his heart are with the children that are down here on earth. He wants everyone home. That's where the cloud is at. The cloud is at that point where Jesus just wants his children home. Jesus is in the field harvesting. You didn't get me. Let me illustrate it for you. Do you know why the Bible says you pray and do not get because you pray amiss? Sometimes it is because we don't pray under the cloud. There is a lack of testimonies in the church of healing. I'm, 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 I'm not talking about those funny healings. That's not what I'm talking about. Why is it that the church go for so long time without miracles happening? Ah, let me tell you. The context of Jesus' miracles in the Gospels was Jesus in the fields doing evangelism. Then he went out into the, in, in, into the regions preaching the Gospel and healing the sick. Preaching the Gospel of the Kingdom and healing the sick. I'm saying to you, my friends, once the church gets into the mode of evangelism and the church prays under that cloud because that's where Jesus is at, our homes are going to get healed. Those of us that are struggling with, with personal issues, we are, going to be, we are going to get healed. Have you ever heard people say, you know, I can't do evangelism because, Pastor, I just don't know what is in my home. And I'm like, you don't know what you're saying. Your healing is under the cloud. Pastor, I just cannot get involved with this. For now, I've got some personal issues I'm looking into. 
Don't you know that Jesus is just waiting for you? Let me illustrate it for you and then sit down. My mother is a sister of three brothers. These three brothers have not less than seven kids each. Most of them are boys. In my culture, we don't have counselors. Well, it's, they are there now because we're getting so, getting westernized. But in the traditional sense, the aunt is the great counselor of her nephews and nieces. So if I have a problem in my home, where do I go? In my, counselor, in my, in my culture, we don't go to counselors. Traditionally, we didn't have them. Aunties are these great wise women that you would go to their homes and you would say, Auntie, things are not going well in my home. And she would sit down with you and she would break, she would break down this, this thing called life. She would break it down for you. And when you leave your home, you are all sorted out. Now, if you don't know anything about my mother, she's late now. She's a single woman raising three kids that are going to an Adventist boarding school that is very expensive. And she doesn't have a job. All she does is from November to March, she's in her fields working hard for a harvest so that when she harvests, she sells a proceed, she gets money, and she sends her kids to school. That's my mother. So you nephews and nieces don't make a mistake of having problems during this time. Because she has no time to sit down at home with you and cancel you. But the problem with problems is they don't wait for seasons, do they? And let us not fight now, my wife, because it is during summer and our auntie is in the fields. Is that what problems do? No. So sometimes I often see my, nep my, my nephews and I mean my cousins coming home to speak to my mother because they've had a marriage issue in their home and they're coming to see my mom. And my mom would say, hey, nephew and niece, I have no time to sit down. Here is a plow. Come with me, work alongside me, and then let's talk about your issues while we are working. <laughs> you are not here with me. Jesus is busy in the field right now. He just wants to end this problem of sin. So many people are dying of cancer. So many people are being destroyed in wars. Jesus' heart pulses and yearns for his children. That's what he's focusing on. Oh, there is this lovely person with a problem. They want to bring it to Jesus. Jesus, come. He says, come. I'm in the field. Follow me. That's where I'm in. So don't pray amiss. Pray under the cloud of evangelism and see what the Lord will do. Amen. Are you with me, my friends? Jesus is in the field. How about come with us? I have a question for you, my friend. I'll finish. I have a question for you. The personal ministries department of this church is feeling that the cloud is moving. That we have been sitting in this, in this wilderness of, of, of whatever for a long time. We need to move. And I, I have a sense the cloud has been moving in this church already. I, I hear the stories, how the cloud of evangelism has, has been moved. In fact, my friends, we need to move from talking about evangelism as a program. We now need to talk about evangelism. It is the lifeblood. We cannot afford at any point in time to just sit and feed ourselves as a church. That's not the purpose of the church. By baptizing our all qualified ministers and evangelists, going there for. Have you ever seen what Jesus says there? He says, all power. That's where he begins. All power where? In heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Because of that power, go therefore. Don't worry about your weaknesses. Just go. The cloud is moving. So the cloud is moving. Why would you stay behind? Oh, pastor, I cannot preach. No, God is not interested in your preaching. I cannot sing, pastor. God is not interested in your singing. He's just interested in your availability. Oh, pastor, I'm too weak. Oh, don't worry about your weakness. Don't you know 
that the vessel that is used the most is the vessel that is washed the most. His work through us is his work in us. Just come as you are. I have a question for you. I said the personal ministries are saying that the cloud is moving. And it is moving, my friends. It is moving. Is there a hope up in your life? One person. No, no, no. I did not say you know how to evangelize to them. You know what to say to them. That's beside the point. Just one person you want to see in the kingdom. Is there a person like that? Let me just see you by raising your hand. I didn't say you know what to do with them. I didn't say you're going to go back home and give them Bible studies. No. I didn't say that. Or you're going to go and, and give them that bachelor's DVD. That's not what I say. The question is simple. Is there a person in your life like Hobab was in Moses' life? And Moses makes an invitation. And you, you, you don't know how to say and how to do it. But there's that person. And you are thinking about them right now as I speak to you. Is there a person like that? I invite you in your heart just to raise your hand. I see some hands that are raised. These guys are coming to you. Let me tell you what they're coming to you to do. They're coming to you for you to write the name. That's all you're going to do. Write the name and we're going to pray for these people. Then the Holy Spirit will do the rest. Amen. Amen. Keep, ready. Keep your hands raised. These guys are coming to you. I'll give you a pen and a paper. All you're going to do is to write a name. A person that the Lord, the Holy Spirit is giving to you. Don't, don't think too hard. Not two people, not three people. Just one. Just one person. You don't even know what to do. You have no clue. That's besides the point. It's not your ability. It's your availability that is important right now. Just one. Your heart yearns, perhaps you've already prayed for them before, and as you, as you commune with them, as you meet with them, you don't even know what is the right thing to say right now. Oh, should I be, should I be saying this or should I not be? And, and you're going to, that person, that's the person I'm thinking about. Just write their name down. And you know what we're going to do? In a moment, I'm going to invite Pastor Andrew to pray for this person. Right now. And guess what? Every Sabbath at 9 o'clock, every Sabbath at 9 o'clock, right through to September, we'll be praying for this name. That's all we're going to be doing. And we leave the results with God. All right. Now, I have some important deaths to share with you. I have some important deaths to share with you. On the 20th of September, some of the people that you are writing there, don't ask me how it's going to happen, I just know it's going to happen. Some of the people whose names you are writing down there are going to be baptized on the 28th of September, 2019. The personal ministry's department sat down and they said 20 of them, at least 20 of them, I, I don't know about you, I said, okay, it's them that are saying that maybe it's the Holy Spirit moving them. I wanted 50, but they said 20. 20 of them on the 20th of September are going to be baptized. How is this going to happen? Let me show you how we are going to move. On the 11th of May, it's going to be Mother's Day service here at church. Here's the clue. I'm going to invite you to invite them to the Mother's, Mother's Day service on the 11th of May. All you do, whether by phone or by a text message, just invite them. Some of them are going to say no. Don't push it. When they say no, they say, okay, thank you very much. I just thought you'd love to come to a Mother's Day. It's going to be a very flame, oh, not flame, friendly 
It's going to be a very friendly atmosphere. There's going to be nothing threatening. They're not going to be Bible bashed or anything like that. It's just going to be a good, friendly atmosphere that we're going to have here in church. They will feel good to be here. I can assure you of that. Text message, call them, go and invite them in person, or one other way of invitation, whatever way of invitation, do it, just invite them on the 20th of May. On the 26th of May is a Sunday. No, I'm not inviting you to church, I'm not inviting you to another program. All you need to do is to cook good food at your house <laughs> and invite them. Did you see that we picked a particular date? Invite them home, this very same person, invite them home to come for this dinner. When they come, don't Bible bash them about the mark of the beast and national Sunday law. <laughs> Let them just come to eat good food. Are you still with me? Yeah. I said the cloud is moving. Let them just come to cook your best meal. Invite them. It might happen that that Sunday you are busy, you are working, you are doing something. Don't worry. Find a day in the week, in that same week, that starts that Sunday. The reason is this. Here is the reason. Here is the reason. The Sabbath following that is the 1st of June. In the afternoon, we are going to sit Sabbath afternoon after lunch. 1st of June, there's going to be lunch. And then after lunch, we are going to come back into the church. Each one of us, for those that might have testimonies, if you don't have a testimony, you don't have anything to share, that's fine. But if you have a testimony to share about what happened at the meal, you will share with us what went on in that event. Are you still with us? One more death. We'll keep reminding you this. This will come up, this death will come up in your, in your bulletin. But I just want you to see how the cloud is moving here. On the 15th of June, there's going to be a movie night at church. There's going to be a movie night right here at church. Don't worry, it's not going to be one of those violent movies. It's going to be a very good movie. Let's come, let's bring them to a movie night. If they say no, don't push it. August 3 is going to be a guest day or visitor's day. It's going to be a special day. Invite them to the guest day. August 24th in the evening, the whole Sabbath will be a multicultural day. If you have a cultural dress, put on the dress of your culture. If you are Aussie like my friend, Sandra, put on an Aussie culture with those you know, those beautiful regalias. If you are Indian, like my brother Ashok, put on those Indian regalia. If you are African, like my, 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 um, my double, <laughs> brother Patrick, put on African regalia. And let's do it. And let's have a multicultural. That same night, we're going to have another multicultural thing. Even these games nights that we do have, please bring them here. Bring them here. Then guess what? September 7th, we begin an evangelistic campaign. Amen. And September 28th, some of them are going to be baptized. Here is what I'm thinking. We've given out about 180 of these papers. I'm not naive to believe that all of them are going to be, all the invitations are going to be, some hopers will not come. Imagine if 100 out of the 180, 100, 50% of them, if 50% of them are accepted and they kept coming through. And if 50 of them come to our evangelistic campaign, let me tell you, my friends, here is my conviction. My conviction is this. The last day message properly presented makes so much sense. It is the answer to the problems of this world to the hopelessness that we have in this world, if it's properly presented. And we don't have to have individuals that, that can present it properly. The Holy Spirit is here. He does that. That's his job. It is so irresistible that 80% of them must accept the gospel. 
That's how this thing, that's how the cloud is moving. Now, starting this coming Sabbath, from 9 o'clock to 20 past 9, the church will be praying. My brother Peter is going to be leading a, a prayer program at church. I have said I'm going to try by all means to be here Sabbath morning. This year, I was just talking to Pastor Andrew. We are rejecting calls to go out of Australia to do evangelism. They've been called, coming already and said, no, our focus is here. There are so many other preachers who can preach there. God has assigned us here. So let's do it here. So we're focused right here. That's all we're doing. So starting next Sabbath, if the Lord helps us with health and good life, before I go to preach at Fairfield, 9 o'clock I'll be here for prayer. If you, if, if you want to be part of that prayer, our focus is praying for evangelism and those names that you've just written down. But if you have any other prayer requests, come along, let's pray together about those problems. I'm assuring you, there's a God in heaven who answers prayer. Amen. I'm just telling you this, I know this from my heart, I've seen the Lord, sometimes I pray when I'm lazy at my house, I'm praying for something and it doesn't go away. Every time I've prayed when it is evangelism, something just happens. I don't know how it works, but I know it works that way. So I'm asking you, next Sabbath, 9 o'clock to 20 past 9, I need 10 minutes to find my way to, to, to Fairfield. Starting next Sabbath, 9 o'clock, if you can be here, we have the prayer leader. Any one of you can be a prayer warrior. Don't worry, there's no, I'm not going to be measuring your faith at the door. Are you prayerful enough in your life? How is your, we are not going to be asking about that because God says, come as you are. He wants us just the way we are. And there's going to be healing in the house. And God bless you. Amen. Now what I'm going to invite you to do is to push the papers this way. Pastor Andrew is coming up front to pray. Those papers, we're going to put them in this. We're not going to read your name. We don't need to know who it is. You just push the papers to the person who is sitting on the left. Or it's your left, yes. In the box. They're coming to they're coming to collect. Let's do it quick. We we have, our time is run out. If you think of a name afterwards, just write it and come and put it in this box. I'm going to leave it here. All we're doing is we're praying. Yes. All we're doing, there is no, there is no spiritual abracadabra here. We're just praying. That's all we are doing. Praying for God to bless these people. Praying for God to protect these people. Praying for God to soften their hearts to accept the gospel. Amen. That's all we're doing. And we're going to pray for ourselves too. But as for now, we're praying for this. For God, we don't know what to do. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. We have no clue. But I know that God has a plan. May God Amen. bless you. Amen. Amen. People want to hand it in those names? Yes. You have more names? Yes. Bring them forward, okay? Bring them forward. You can see what God is doing in the life of our church here. You know, the three angels' messages are God's last altar call to the world. Christ is soon to come. Amen? Amen? But He wants to restore. He wants the people ready for His coming. And so, we're just so thankful that we can do this work here. When I say we, I'm not talking about Pastor Tappy and myself. We're saying we. Amen? We can do this work here. And the Holy Spirit is doing the work. You know, there are people sitting here that are... That, that, don't know half the things that you know, but God has brought them in and they're learning, they're growing, they're finding the gospel of Christ and the present truth for our time. So let's bow our heads and let's ask God to continue to add to His church as He loves to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, Your Word says that grace and truth came by Your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we sit here, Lord, we believe that it is that, Lord, that brings enmity, Lord, between the powers of good and the powers of evil, Lord. It's grace and truth, Father, by which you work. And so, Father, as we consider these names, Lord, that we have brought forth, and as we consider, Lord, as you lay more on our heart, Lord, that we can be a church, Father, that, 
that as your son said, Lord, uh, in, in the parable of the marriage feast, Lord, to, we can be a people that go out into the highways and byway, byways and invite those to come, Lord, to sit at your feet and hear, Lord, of the sacrifice of your son, Lord, for their salvation. To hear, Lord, of the truth, Lord, that is, that, that is carried by those three angels, Lord, for our time. Father, we believe, Lord, as a people here, that you will do your mighty work. We believe that you will add souls, Father, to your kingdom in preparation, Father, for the coming of your Son. Father, this is your remnant church. These are your remnant people. And we thank you, Father, that you hear us. We thank you, Lord, that you, you not only call us, Lord, as we have heard from the message today, as we, as we make a decision to make ourselves available for you, but you equip us, Lord, as you did Moses, Lord, as you did Isaiah, Lord, and all those who never felt worthy, never felt capable. Lord. That's us, Lord, today, Lord. It's not by might nor by power, but by your Spirit, Amen. as your Word says. And so, Father, bless us and bless our efforts. And may we rejoice, Lord, in what you will do from this day forth. Amen. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.